Hi, I'm Michael Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center, and this is the ATC Double Cut. I'm going to take a look at a couple blog posts in this episode, and one of them is a really fun project that I did a couple weeks ago in Thailand, in Hua Hin. The filmmaker Matthias Bronholm from Brahma was in Thailand for the international series tournament at Black Mountain Golf Club. And he's been really interested in MLSN as a way to make fertilizer recommendations. He contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in doing some filming with him about that. And we spent uh, two days together, or half of half of one day, half of another day, at Black Mountain Golf Club and at Banyan Golf Club, talking about MLSN and doing some filming about that. So there's going to be a a film of some sort coming up about this, I believe. I'm not sure when it's going to be released, but it is something that could be really interesting for people who already use MLSN, and probably it will be interesting for people who don't know about MLSN or don't really know the story because Matthias is a professional filmmaker and he is uh, he's very knowledgeable about how to tell stories and we talked about that a lot and I got all kinds of ideas from him about how to better uh, explain about MLSN it was it was really fun and I'm looking forward to that film if you go to the blog post again as with all ATC double cuts I'll put in the description or in the show notes direct links to these posts or you can find them on asianturfgrass.com you can see some behind the scene fo- fo- some behind the scenes photos of our shoot which was uh, a lot at Banyan Golf Club which is just a beautiful facility in Huahin and i guess explain MLSN if you're hearing about this for the first time or if you already use MLSN and want to hear what I have to say about it I think it comes back to me that when we're taking care of grass we need to answer the question do we need to apply this particular element as fertilizer that that is a important fundamental question to ask do we need to add nitrogen? Do we need to add potassium? Do we need to add phosphorus? And if that that basically is a yes or no answer. If we need to apply it, the answer is yes. If we don't need to apply that element, the answer is no. And then if the answer happens to be yes, there is a natural follow-up question, which is how much of this element should I apply? Well, MLSN answers that question and it gives the right answer to that question pretty much anytime, pretty much anywhere in the world. It it is specifically designed to prevent nutrient deficiencies. So if it's going to err on any side of the exactly correct answer, the error will be on the high side. It is specifically designed to, if anything, recommend a little bit more than the grass can use in order to ensure that there are no deficiencies. And it's really interesting because compared to traditional or conventional soil test interpretation, MLSN comes in way below what conventional recommendations would be. And so it's, it's an interesting situation to be in where the MLSN recommendation is lower. The MLSN recommendation is lower than conventional guidelines, but it's also a little bit conservative in that it is making a recommendation that is almost guaranteed to 
supply all the nutrients that the grass can use and to err a little bit on the side of over application for the purpose of preventing deficiency. So that uh, is something that I think is important to understand about how MLSN works like that. And I'm sure that in that upcoming film, it will be explained um, in a much more interesting way than this. The, the post that I want to spend most of the time talking about today is a, kind of a classic one. It's from 2020 when I originally did it. Uh, let me let me bring up this post. And it's it's a conversation that I've had recently. It's this one is called a tale of two tests. And it's about two types of organic matter testing. I have had a couple of conversations over the past week or so with people about the specific types of organic matter testing. And I think it's something that I want to reiterate is that there's two types of tests. I recommend doing both of them. And I want to point out exactly what the distinction is between conventional soil organic matter testing and the OM246 test, which is total organic material. Um, let's start. Let's start with soil organic matter. And this type of test is um, it, it's sometimes called the humus. So it's soil organic matter or SOM or humus. That is a standard test. And the procedure involves taking a soil sample at the laboratory, drying and grinding or crushing that soil sample, passing that sample through a two millimeter sieve to take out any rocks. And what's very key at this stage, at that stage, as the soil is passed through the sieve, it also removes the, what's left behind on that screen, on that sieve, is any undecomposed living and dead plant material. And what passes through is the humus, the humic material in the soil, and that is what then is measured typically by a loss on ignition test. That's what, that's what you see when you're getting a soil nutrient test, a type of test where you'll get typically pH and potassium and phosphorus, and the very useful number that I think uh, should, be, should be tested is soil organic matter. That's a really, really useful number. In this blog post called A Tale of Two Tests, I point out some of the things that you can get from that typical organic matter test and the types of information that, that you will find will be correlated with that or that can be predicted from the soil organic matter include the relative water holding capacity of the soil. This is particularly true in sand root zones. And it's also related to the nutrient supply. One can actually use an equation to predict the cation exchange capacity of a sand root zone based on the soil organic matter. So one can look at the nutrient holding capacity, and one can also look at the nutrient supplying capacity, specifically the nitrogen mineralization. There's various equations that one can use to predict the annual or the, well, you can actually do this daily, weekly, monthly, or on an annual basis to predict the amount of nitrogen that will be mineralized from soil organic matter. And in fact, I, I do this on a monthly basis for the ATC soil test reports where we look at what the soil organic matter was at the time of testing. And for the next 12 months, I will predict the estimated nitrogen mineralization from the soil organic matter for a particular site. So that's, to me, that's really useful. The, the organic matter 
I guess I didn't mention it in the post, I don't think, but you could also use this to look at carbon sequestration in the soil. So you'd be, you could be looking at how much carbon is, is in the soil, how much nitrogen will be mineralized, what's the relative nutrient holding capacity and nutrient supplying capacity of the soil, and how much water can the soil hold. So that is a useful number. That is the soil organic matter. That is the humus. Now, there is something that's really missing there because people do a, turfgrass managers are doing a huge amount of work to manage a different kind of organic matter in the soil. And I put a heading in this post. I said, and aside, there's a lot of of work done to adjust a different type of organic matter and i then i wrote there's another type of organic matter that turfgrass managers do a ton of work to deal with call it thatch or fiber or total organic matter or whatever this is the material that all the scarifying scalping core removal sand top dressing sand injection and so on is done to deal with the organic matter i discussed previously the humus the 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 standard soil organic matter test where you've screened off all the undecomposed living and dead plant material that is a useful number but it's not measuring thatch and i had realized this but it started to hit home for me in oh 2015 2016 that there were often cases where I wanted to know what the organic, the total organic material was and to get some measure of how thatch was changing in the soil or how the mat layer, the, the total organic material in the soil was changing. And in fact, I'd, I'd done some tests, some specific tests I'd done uh, were after I'd visited PGA Catalunya where David Batelle is doing his excellent maintenance there and one of the interesting things he does, as I'm sure many of you have heard of, is make some treatments with hydrogen peroxide to the greens. And I was very interested to know if that hydrogen peroxide treatment was causing a change in the total organic material. And we designed a little uh, sampling survey and some treatments where uh, some areas of the green would receive the hydrogen peroxide treatment. Some areas of the green would not receive the hydrogen peroxide treatment. And then we collected samples prior to and after a series of treatments. And I had them tested and I was testing for what I thought was total organic material. And I had been back and forth in communication with the laboratory prior to doing this. I had been back and forth with the laboratory um, to make sure that we were getting just the test that I wanted. And that test that I wanted was, uh, please don't remove any of the material because I understood that a regular soil test would just screen off any of the undecomposed living and dead plant material, any of the thatch and mat material, any of the big chunks of organic material in the soil. I knew that the conventional test, which is quite useful, but it wasn't really what I wanted in this case, because I wanted to see what's, what's all the organic material if we don't put hydrogen peroxide, and does that change if we put hydrogen peroxide? Well, um, I, I was a little bit disappointed when I got the results back from the lab after I'd made this request. And I thought that the test that I was getting was total organic matter. And then the numbers came back at like 1.8%, 1.6% organic matter. And this, I believe this was in the top two inches. And I'm like, that, that can't be the real number. I know the total organic material must be higher. So I asked more and more questions, and it turned out that this was one of those tests that has a standardized procedure, and there's a hidden uh, 
hidden aspect of that, that this particular test had to pass through, I believe it was a four millimeter sieve. So the sample did have to pass through a sieve before it was analyzed, even though it was described as a, as a measure of total organic material. And I thought this is just, it's frustrating that I, I think a lot of turf grass managers are wanting to know how the top dressing, how the aerification is affecting the total organic material, but many of the tests don't seem to be measuring that. So that, um, that combined with, um, yeah, just, just really wanting to understand what was happening under the, under the grass, under the surface of the greens, uh, made me want to start doing the total organic material testing. And as you will know, this OM246, which, which is what I'm talking about now is the total organic material, the test that's done where the samples are not passed through a sieve and where the samples are measured in their entirety. This is not something that I invented. As I've mentioned before, this is something that was fairly standard in New Zealand uh, for about 20 years, as, as far as I know. Um, Alex Glasgow has an excellent paper about that from 2005. I'll put a link to that also in the description. Um, and the STRI have done a lot of that testing. I know um, ETL, European Turfgrass Laboratories, I, I understand that they do that type of testing also in the UK. And they're doing this in uh, increments of zero to two centimeters, two to four centimeters, and four to six centimeters, sometimes six to eight centimeters. Sometimes I understand they'll split that top uh, zero to two centimeters down into a zero to one and a one to two centimeter increment. So the, it's, it's kind of at those standard depths and those tests are, are taking cores from turf grass surfaces and just measuring all of the material that's sent in. They are not passing it through a sieve. Now, remember, I'm, I'm not saying don't do the regular organic matter testing. I'm saying I like to do the OM246 as a supplement to that. Now, I've had some... I mentioned that I've had some discussions in the past week about the difference between them. And I remembered I'd done this blog post, so I wanted to uh, bring this up, reshare it and discuss it a little bit because there, there still is sometimes some confusion about it. I, I recommend doing the OM246 test at a burn temperature of 440 degrees and that 440 degrees Celsius that turns all the organic material to a white ash, a little powder that just, uh, blends in with, uh, the soil and there's really no fiber, nothing left. I've done comparison testing between with paired samples between 360 degree burns, which is customary for typical soil organic matter testing. I've done those comparisons with paired samples between a 360 degree burn and a 440 degree burn, they give the same number, but I just like the way that the 440 looks when it's af after it comes out of the muffle furnace, because with 360 degree burns, there still is a little bit of black charred material remaining. Now it doesn't, it doesn't really weigh anything, but the sample looks different. And for me, I just prefer the way it looks after a burn at 440. And it's, it's not that I'm saying 440 degrees is, um, is going to give a different number than 360 or that it's so essential to get the right result with the OM246 test that you have to do 440. You could, you could do it at 360 too. Um, so the, the temperature is not a big deal, but definitely, uh, for consistency and standardization, uh, I think it makes sense to do it at 440. But there, somebody was asking me 
about the temperature difference. And I said, Hey, that's, that's not really the issue. It's not the issue about whether one lab is burning at 360. And I'm saying that the OM246 is at 440. The key thing about OM246 testing, well, there's two of them, but the, uh, one of them is really easy to understand. One of them, I think there still is some confusion about the, so I'll talk about that. And that's about passing through the screen. The, the key thing with the OM246 test is the sample is collected at the golf course or at the football pitch or wherever one is wanting to do this type of testing. The lawn, for example, if one wants to be a uh, very, uh, what do they call them? The real mower guys out there. Um, if, if you're mowing your lawn with a real mower, you might be interested in doing OM246 testing on your lawn. So the, the key thing is the sample in its entirety goes to the lab and gets analyzed. The sample does not really get treated at the lab. The, you don't take a, a subsample out of that at the laboratory. The sample is not passed through a screen at the laboratory. It is, it's taken all of the soil material that is sent and all of that material is burned because anybody who's ever taken a sample out of a say a creeping bent grass putting green knows that there's a lot of fibrous material right at the surface and just imagine how how can you subsample that uh without being like if you send that to the laboratory and then try to scoop out five grams of, of material for the test, it, it doesn't really work um, because you might inadvertently get too much sand or you might inadvertently pull in too much of the fiber. And so the idea with OM246 is that you just test everything. So that's, that's really the key to it. That the big difference between conventional soil organic matter testing, which is measuring the humus in the soil, and that's just taking a very tiny bit of soil. And, but see that soil has already been homogenized to some extent by drying it, crushing it or grinding it, and then passing it through the sieve. So then you take a tiny sample out of that. It goes in a tiny little crucible. It goes in the muffle furnace. Um, the mass loss on ignition is measured after that's burned, typically at 360 degrees Celsius. And one gets the humus, the organic matter, the soil organic matter, the, the very definition of soil organic matter. So then with OM246, we take the entire sample. And I recommend taking a sample that, um, that comes to be at least 30 cubic centimeters up to about 125 cubic centimeters in volume so we're looking at something from uh in united states customary units something like uh, half a cup half a cup maximum um down to something that's less uh, something like a one eighth from one eighth of a cup uh up to about Oh, one half of a cup of material. That to me is a nice volume of material to work with. And the laboratory just takes it, dries it, puts it in the muffle furnace and burns it. It's, it's not something that gets treated. It's, it doesn't pass through a screen. That's the key thing. And the other key, th the other key thing that is different about this test is it is measured at specific depths. So the, and those depths tend to be different than what um, a tradition, a, a conventional soil organic matter test is. Uh, a a conventional soil organic matter test is done on a sample that will have been taken to probably a 10 centimeter depth, four inches, which is what I recommend for turf grass. Sometimes people will take it at three inches, 7.5 centimeters. Regardless, that is a uh, something that is trying to look at the entire root zone, basically the primary root zone of the soil. And that is the organic matter through that entire depth. 
the other thing about OM246 or this total organic material testing is it's done at different depths. And those different depths, I recommend doing zero to two centimeters, two to four centimeters, and four to six centimeters. Now you're looking at total organic material at very specific depths in the soil. And it's all the material getting tested. In the blog post, I showed how there tends to be more change at the zero to two centimeter depth than there is at the two to four centimeter and four to six centimeter depths. Remember, this is only going down to about 2.4 inches. If I remember right, six centimeters is 2.4 inches. So that's, it's not, it's not very deep in the soil. And the typical coring process, the typical air, hollow tine aerification will go down to about seven or eight centimeters. So it's, it's actually deeper than the OM246 testing, but we can see that at, at the two to four centimeter depth and at the four to six centimeter depth, there's very little change typically in the amount of organic material uh, accumulation or depletion there's just not a lot happening at those steps. So um, one of the interesting things, one of the things that surprised me at first, and now I just kind of expect it, is that when the test is done and one starts to find that the organic material is not changing so much, uh, down below two centimeters, it really brings into question whether one needs to be putting sand down to those depths, which makes me wonder about some of the coring and uh, um, other, other practices where you remove material and put fresh sand down. Um, and I think that this type of testing where one is checking everything checking all of the organic material at specific depths it is it is very informative and can be used quite effectively as a decision making tool to help decide what the optimum management can be for a facility i hope you'll ch check out those posts and make sure for this upcoming season for those of you in the northern hemisphere make sure that you understand the distinction between the typical soil organic matter test and the type of organic material that is measured on the om246 test for atc in mchenry i'm michael woods